Welcome everybody. I'm Alison Grieve, one of the directors here at Management Dynamics, and I'm joined, of course, by my lovely business partner, Jenny Miller. Um, and we're really delighted to welcome you to the first in our series on uh, leadership, where we're inviting amazingly experienced world around uh, leaders to come and join us and share their stories and insights about leadership. And of course, to kick off that series, it's great that we've got Mike Dixon joining us. Um, and Mike's been involved in the music industry globally for a very long time. He has huge amounts of experience. Um, he's been a music director on productions like We Will Rock You, The Bodyguard, Joseph. Um, he's been involved in variety, Royal Variety performances, performed at Glastonbury with Shirley Bassey. He's also worked with people like Andrew Lloyd Webber and other icons like Lionel Richie and Queen, Lady Gaga, Elton John. And of course, he's worked with the British um, BBC uh, Concert Orchestra and the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, amongst other stuff. Um, I'd also add into that, he's worked with us on some leadership programmes too. Start with that, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> he is, of course, a music director, a conductor and an author. So he's got an amazing book. We'll tell you more about that later. But um, it's great to have you here with us, Mike, and we're really looking forward to hearing about it. But how did all this start? Well, it's lovely to be here and, and see everybody and say hello. Um, it really started, I was very, very lucky as a young as a young boy at primary school, I had a fantastic headmaster um, at my primary school who basically gave me a piano. And that's that's the beginning. And then in my in my secondary school, I had a wonderful music teacher who was an entirely inspirational. So it all st stems, you know, so often it's that these things stem from that teaching that you get early on. Yeah, I, I think it's wonderful when you can get inspired by somebody uh, so early in, you know, in your life and it came up as a sort of life goal. What would, you know, looking back over your career, what would you say have been some of the highlights? Well, you've mentioned one and I mean, I have to say, standing up in front of a whatever it was 30 piece orchestra at Glastonbury with Dame Shirley um I mean a 30 piece orchestra is unheard of at Glastonbury as you know uh yeah. that's the first thing but then you know the reception of those hundred and whatever it was thousand people there uh on top of you know the global audience watching was just fantastic it was it was that was really exciting and then yeah I, and then I suppose the other one would be playing and MDing the Queen segment and the We Will Rock You segment at the Queen's Golden Jubilee concert, which was outside Buckingham Palace uh, back in 2002. That's the one that where Brian May stood on the top of Buckingham Palace originally and, play, and played God Save the Queen. And then we did a, a, a segment of that. And I was I was playing I was playing piano. One of the things that I, I was MDing it, but I was also playing the piano. And of course, that meant that I had to play Freddie Mercury's famous Bohemian Rhapsody piano part. So no pressure, no pressure. You know, no pressure. No so pressure. not just, you know, conducting it and organising it all, but also performing Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. A little aside that will make you giggle. The, the stage manager, who I knew quite well from other TV stuff, Toby, as I was about to walk on the stage, he said, have a good one, Mike, have a good one. Only 150 people, oh no, 100, 150 million people watching <laughs> live. Right. So no pressure. no pressure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, you know, when you look back, which are the bits that you've enjoyed most? I mean, what is it? Because there's a lot of passion that comes out of you as you talk about these stories. What is it that gives you that I think, motivation I think, and enjoyment? I think, I think it's actually working with people. I mean, you can have as much analysis and 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 pre-work and 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 putting stuff together on your own but when you actually get into a room with a bunch of musicians or you get into a room with a bunch of actors who are going to sing and you start working with them that's when stuff starts to become exciting 
And I suppose, you know, some things we can maybe explore a bit later is how, I mean, you're working with people at the top of their game, they're best in their fields. Um, and they're obviously, you know, your top of uh, your game. And that difference in sort of average performance and it being amazing. Yeah, I'd like to understand how do you unlock that in people? Um, well, I, I think one of the most important things is if you can convey to people that you trust them to do their bestest if you like if you can get them if you can get them to see that you trust them they will trust you more i mean obviously providing you also give of your best um but but that trust i think is probably the most important thing if you haven't got that trust either between you the you and the artists or the artist and you then everything is going to fall down mm -hmm. really interesting to explore that a little bit more yeah, I wonder if it's yeah. Worth at this point now that we've introduced you mike and yes. mm. we've got a little a little glimpse of the kinds of things you like that it's hard to imagine what exactly it is that you are doing every day and you, you you've got a little video haven't haven't you that that i have just gives us a, a, a bit of a better picture of what it's like to be in your shoes and the kinds of things that you're doing um would you, as I'm setting it up, would you say a little bit more about it? Because it kind of goes straight into it, doesn't it? We're, we're going to yes, it goes. Working with Shirley Bassey, aren't, aren't Yeah, we? so basically this is um, a little tiny segment of me working with Dame Shirley on, um, it was a song that Gary Barlow wrote for the the album, the performance that she, she did. And she was finding it quite difficult to learn the song because it was really long. So it starts with a, an interview with Alan Yentob Dame Shirley and me just working together and Dame Shirley <laughs> trying to trying to condense the song. And She's a bit frustrated, isn't she? She's getting yeah, she just a little bit, yeah. Just a little bit. <laughs> Okay. Let's let's watch the video. It's about six minutes long. I think it's a lovely introduction to kind of the world that you're in, and then we'll we'll, we'll start to to pick this apart as how you create these wonderful performances with the teams that you're working with. The sheer amount of lyrics is new to Shirley. I can't give it a performance, you know. I can't. It's, it's, it's words, 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 words. I mean, maybe there's some bits that we can take out. Maybe there's some things that we can just take out and release it. I mean, you can't do that on stage. I would. I think, yeah, I, I think we'd have to. I would bring it all in like that. We, we would have found to a way, I think, at the end of the rehearsal for her to understand the song. And we made a little trim of the, the very last chorus. We just cut a little bit out of that, which seemed to really help the shape. I know this heart, the heart. And what was fascinating was watching the repetition. Repetition caused some little cog to sort of go into place. I know this time's forever. And after a, only about three or four times of singing it all the way through, suddenly it became her song. It stopped being Gary's song, if you like, and it became her song. It seemed to just gel. In 2007, she played the coveted Sunday afternoon legend slot at Glastonbury. This strange thing to call with this electricity in the air, you know. And I was I was away with it. I got caught up in it. So this song is for all you big spenders, okay? Something about that, as an orchestra starts to actually get itself together, starts to tune itself up, and, and they're just doing a little, having a little look at some of the bits and bobs that they were going to be playing later. There's always that. I know I feel that sort of element of, you know, little frog in my throat and excitement and, and all that sort of stuff. Could you 
could we could we put a Sforzando piano crescendo on that last E that we hit, that last chord? And can we just play the last four bars again? We have to rehearse really quickly and make instant decisions. I had a little rehearsal yesterday, so we were able to go through most of the stuff. But obviously today, this afternoon, it's critical. We've got three, three and a half hours to rehearse the whole concert. So we can't do everything and you know, go into the nitty gritty detail. I have to rely on the professionalism of the orchestra. And with this orchestra, I know I can rely. Are you sorting out your choreography? Yeah, oh, three. We should never rehearse it. Can we just play from uh, eight, eight before letter I, please? So we finished our rehearsal. Now we've got a couple of hours before we actually go live. I mean, there's a, a few little moments where I'm going, oh, I've got to remember that, and I've got to remember that. A few little places, that, I, little corners that I know might trip us up. And I don't want us to trip up, obviously, because we're live. And we can't, we don't have the luxury. No retakes, no retakes. There's always the, the sort of five, ten minutes before. And then you get out there, and you know it's live, and you start, and it's all hopefully fine. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I have a clock down here which is telling me it's two minutes to eight. We have a three minute news. Ten minutes. News so, news. He just said we're live in two minutes. We're not live. Or live. Are we live? <laughs> we're live! Um, please welcome Big Chino, Mr. Mike Dixon! Hey. Here we are, it's kind of, that's a one only event. This evening was the only time that concert will ever be performed. We never rehearsed it all the way through with all the links and everything. The only time we've ever performed it is between eight o'clock and 10 o'clock tonight. That's what these shows are like. I mean, it's, it's, it's a brilliant joy to be part of it, but it's also quite stressful at the time. And right now I feel like going and having a nice large glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did have. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I bet. Um, I, I, I mean, it really comes to life, um, you know, seeing the different kinds of activities that you were leading. Um, and you talked before about it being trust. Can you tell us a bit more about how you built trust? Because it looked like it was two way. Um, that trust no, it, it's totally two way you, you you have to completely trust those people that you're working with um, and and in this in this kind of context or in the kind kind of context of putting a, a concert together as I say in that video you've only got a short amount of time to rehearse mm -hmm. so so and you go in on the afternoon and you start rehearsing with the orchestra there and then and if you don't, if you have any, any, any Achilles heel, first of all, they'll find it out. <laughs> the orchestra will find out, you know, that you've got, there's something that you do, don't do quite right or, or don't, you know, don't communicate the right way. Don't, don't give the right inspirational lead, if you, if you like. 
Um, and also, I I know, you know, if I'm working with a, an orchestra like the BBC Content Orchestra, that I can trust them to, you know, if there's a little if there's a little corner that's a tiny bit unpolished in the rehearsal, I could spend ten minutes making that right, or I could trust them to know that they need to just look at it for two seconds after the rehearsal's finished and that then it'll be okay in the show. And that happens 99.99999% of the time. So, you know, that, but that again, that is to do with their professionalism. And mm. I trust, you know, I have, I have absolute trust in them. Is that because you've worked with them before? Like in, in that example, had you, had you regularly done stuff? Yes, at that, that, at that point, because yeah. I suppose for about 20 years, I regularly um, did four or five concerts with the BBC Concert Orchestra through, you know, Friday nights, music nights and various things like that. So there was a, a simpatico between us and they knew me right. and I knew them. But uh, equally, if you go in and work with a, a, a brand new orchestra, you very, very quickly suss out who their leaders are, if you like. Okay. So, so you know, within within the orchestra, you've got the various sections. You've got the string section, the woodwind section, the brass section, the percussion, and you very quickly suss, you know, and understand who, I mean, yes, there are named leaders, and the leader of the orchestra, the first violin player, is the person that everybody looks to, to see, uh, to see, frequently to see to see where you know and how they should behave and if the leader stands up everybody goes oh hello something's a bit you know awry um but but if you're going in that first time with a new orchestra you see that you know that you need to be able to talk very clearly to the leader of the trumpets because that's a really important person in the orchestra just like the 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 principal clarinetist, the principal oboist, the principal flautist, you know, and all the different sections within um, the the strings. Actually, you've got first fiddles, second fiddles, violas, cellos, basses. So, so you 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 know that there are sort of faces that you need to get on with. And do you meet with them individually beforehand, or is it always no. just the sort of group thing? Not really. I mean, if it's a if it's a brand new, you know, I, I'm working with, for example, um, I did a, a a concert with the Royal Liverpool Phil, hmm. and the first time I met anybody in the orchestra was on the two o'clock, you know, when the rehearsal started. I mean, yes, I got there early, and yes, there were some people there early, and I was able to go and just say hello, you know. But it was really that the two o'clock when when the rehearsal officially starts that's when their attention is on me and my attention is on them and we make the concert happen mm. and I was, as, I, as I was watching you know the orchestra play in that video I was reflecting on how easy you all make it look first of all I'm sure it's not easy at all spoken mirrors uh, spoken mirrors yeah, <laughs> spoken mirrors, yeah. But also got me thinking about, you know, there's, there's organisations who are looking at whether they can have leaderless teams. You, the orchestra makes it look so easy mm -hmm. and actually you, you might question whether your role is actually needed, Mike. What would happen if, if an orchestra didn't have a conductor? Well, actually, there's a there's a lovely um, TV programme where, where Andre Previn, mm -hmm. who used to do this regular thing with the London Symphony Orchestra on telly, he did a... Um, a for example of and it, I think it was a piece of Mozart um, and he said now look I'm going to I'm going to start them off and then I'm going to leave and see what happens it won't take long before they fall apart so he starts them he walks off the stage goes and sits in the audience with somebody he's got a microphone on obviously and um, 10 bars 16 bars 32 bars they're still playing it's still all Staying together. He, he says, oh, no, they'll, they'll be fall, they'll fall apart at any point soon, at any point soon. And of course, they didn't because, because they, they, the orchestra, wanted to prove that <laughs> little point for themselves. The, the truth of the matter is that there has to be somebody who gives the corners and, and just adjusts necessarily the pathway that the orchestra need to go on. Yeah. So, and that's fundamentally what I need to do. 
I mean, just just beating time. I mean, that's I have a laugh, you know, and and smile and all that sort of stuff. It's the points of it's the points where you begin. It's the points in the middle, perhaps where you slow down, where you have a bit more reflection, where it's also in the more romantic and more and more gentle moments where you need to have a little a bit. The, 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 the musical technical term is rubato, but trying to get a full orchestra to play rubato, which is kind of push and pull, slightly moving and slightly coming back. So, so you know, it doesn't just stick to the, the metronome. It's mm -hmm. gone away and it comes back and it, it, it moves. So mm -hmm. getting an orchestra to do that all together at the same time, those are things that, that you know, are where your, your role is kind of necessary, I suppose. Yeah. And the ending. <laughs> and, and making sure everybody together. stops at the same time. Yeah, making sure everybody stops at the same time. Yeah, it's interesting. Ali, how do you think that relates back to organisational teams then and the, leader, the role a leader plays in organisational yeah, teams? Yeah, I think, I think it's actually really close to what we're trying to achieve with high performing teams, where we're saying, you know, if you get a team up to high performance, then they should be able to perform really well without you not forever and I think it really links back to what you're saying which is yeah they'll do a great job so you can go on holiday um, but when things are shifting and changing and getting a bit more complicated that's when they need you back to provide some and it's not to step in because I think the other thing I noticed was you're not making the noise they're making the noise exactly. and so you're not stepping in but you're guiding and shaping and giving them direction yeah. yeah, I think that's a real fundamental that, that the conductor must always remember or the leader of the must always the conductor actually in this case conductor must always remember that the baton does not make a noise. Mm -hmm. It is it is down to those amazing players in front of you to make that noise. Mm -hmm. and, and if you if you don't give them the right inspiration or the right musicality or the right feeling, then it won't work as well as it should. Mm. Yeah, it's a lovely analogy, isn't it? And I think, mm. you know, so the other thing that that gets me thinking about is you, your baton doesn't make a noise, and yet you can. We were talking earlier about how you play the piano and the bit of the guitar. I yeah. imagine, I mean, you played that down, Mike. I imagine you're probably very, very good at <laughs> both of those instruments. Well, no, I wasn't so good on the guitar, but I was okay on the piano. Yeah, no, I reckon you're, yeah probably, probably pretty <laughs> professional level, right? And you probably sometimes have a piano player in your in your orchestra, right? Of so course. you could do that person's job. But you choose not to, you choose to trust their professionalism to step back out of it, to not yeah. do it for them, you know, and, and that, that's a lesson for leaders everywhere, isn't it? To know, even if you are an expert in somebody's job, to step out of that and play the role that you need to play, which is leadership. Yeah, sometimes that feeling of being, um, having an overview. It, it, and you're, you know, taking it to the piano thing. If you're, if you're playing the piano, having an overview of what the orchestra sounds like and what everything sounds like is, is almost impossible. You then have to rely on somebody else out, out in the auditorium to tell you, you know, or, 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 you, or you might need to trust somebody to somebody else to do that job. Mm -hmm. So, so no, it, getting away from the, I, I actually remember the first time, the first time I conducted um, without a piano in front of me, um, was 1986, I think it was, and it was at the London Palladium. There you are, there's a name drop. At mm -hmm. the London Palladium, uh, and it was a show called La Cage Folle, and I was associate musical director on that show, which basically meant that I, I'd done all the rehearsals, worked with all the cast, worked with the orchestra, played piano in the band, but as associate musical director, it meant that I got to conduct one show a week. And in the very first week of the show, um of the show running the first wednesday matinee muggins had to stand up in front of the orchestra and the full cast and the two thousand people in the palladium and conduct the show without any rehearsal that's that's just another one you know another layer <laughs> so so everything went really well because obviously i'd done the rehearsals i knew the piece i knew the piece i'd worked with all the cast i'd worked with everybody so i so everything went really well of course i was i was absolutely petrified before but I really enjoyed it had a great time afterwards went out with the musical director a lovely man called David Furman and one of the 
um, one of the blowers, I was going to say, one of the saxophone players called Johnny Franchi, a lovely uh, dour, dour sort of Scotsman. And um, and John said to me afterwards, he said, Mike, he said, we were all on the edge of our seat. You did such a good job. He said, you did such a good job. But but just tell me one thing, he said, at the beginning of that song, Mascara, how, how did you subdivide the beat into 32 like that? Now, I'll just explain that. <laughs> a beat, you know, in a 4-4 in a four, four bar, there are four beats. So, so a 32 beat bar is kind of a bit weird. So I was a bit perplexed, didn't understand what he meant. And then he showed me and he said, Mike, you were like this. <laughs> With the basically the nerve, you know, the ner it was a very shaking slow hands. tempo, a very slow tempo with the shaking hands. Anyway, that was that was the uh, that was the little bit of learning. <laughs> from but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there are times when um, it's it's. I mean, has, I, I've had an extraordinary time in my career. So, um, but that one, <laughs> that's one of those <laughs> panic yeah. moments. I think that also uh, just makes me reflect on another linkage between what you've been saying and business, because often as leaders, we're having to deal with uncertainty and new stuff, but we need to provide certainty to our team and the people that we're leading. And it sounds like that's what you were meant to be doing um, at that time, but it was... <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit shaky yeah well, that, uh, in that inst I think <laughs> I think they they um instead of me instead of them relying on me I was relying on them <laughs> to help get me through it you know yeah. but there was there was already a level of trust because I was I, I'd already worked with them as a as the piano player in the band or in the orchestra. I mean, I think the orchestra for Lacage was a 28 piece, you know, yeah. so 28 yeah. people in the pit. So so they already knew that I was playing, I, I, you know, I was playing the piano in in the band. So, yeah. We, we've so had did. a question come through from Marie in, in the Q&A. And if anybody else wants to add any questions, we will draw upon these. So please do add them to the Q&A or the chat or raise your hand. You can ask it out loud. We'll, we'll, um, we'll help you with that. Um, I thought it was lovely to bring it in at this point, this question. So thank you, Marie. How much of the orchestra's professionalism and discipline comes from, you, from the authority of your director role versus from your personal leadership style? In other terms, what are your very personal co competencies which create this magical mutual trust with your orchestra? That lovely mm -hmm. question. Yeah, it's quite um, it's quite difficult to analyse probably, yeah. um, because th there's a there's a point. I mean, very very occasionally you might have to raise your voice to say, you know, shush, we need to move on or or whatever. Um, but most of the time, there's there's a natural professionalism which is instilled into musicians which 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 is clock oriented in some ways because there's a point where if the rehearsal is from two until five then at five o'clock they will draw stumps and they will they will want to go and have their supper before the gig so 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 they know that i know that we've got to get everything finished before five o'clock. So um, I suppose, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm really answering that question, but it, I suppose in a way I am, that there's a, the, 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 the element of um, that, that mutual understanding of each other, but it's, it's, I know that they will be professional. Yeah. And obviously they hope that I will be professional as well. And I, I suppose, you know, looking at it the other way around, if you were just using your, your authority to get them to do something, yeah, yeah. you'd just be telling them what to do and, and shouting. Yeah, them. I mean, I've witnessed, I've, yeah. I've been on the other end and, and, and witnessed um, conductors who basically shout and scream a lot um, or people, other musical directors I know who um, perhaps have a, a, a an overly authoritarian um, attitude to, to their job. And I, I've always felt, I've always felt that it's that, that to get that group of people working with you, you have to be with them. So to 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 be to be above them, if you like, is kind and and shout and scream and all that sort of stuff, 
kind of doesn't get the right result. Yeah. That gets that gets their back up, it gets them upset, it gets them worried. You I personally don't believe that you're ever gonna get um an orchestra to to give of their best if they're in that state. Yeah. Mm. And one of the things I've noticed as you're talking about that is actually you care about them as whole people. You know, you're talking about we need to stop at this time so they can eat. And I mean, I know that there's leaders out there who say you don't need to eat or sleep. You know, we hear about organizations where people work crazy hours and they yeah. never get breaks. And so that sort of human physical needs as well isn't considered. But from what I hear is they trust you that you're going to make sure that physically they're going to be in a good place so they can perform their best later. Yeah, absolutely. I did. There's one little story that's quite funny. I, I was doing some um, some big sessions with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra at Abbey Road, throwing a few more names in, obviously, sorry. Um, <laughs> but but um, I had a week with an 80 piece orchestra and then another week with a 40 piece orchestra all of the, the the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. It was for a big um, opening of games and stuff that I was doing back in 2017. And um, and I didn't know the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. I didn't know, I think about 85, 90% of them, I didn't know when I walked in on that, on that Monday mm. morning. Um, but by the end of, I think it, by the end of the fourth day, we, we, I'd almost got through all the material. So, I let the whole orchestra go after the Friday morning session. So they all had the Friday afternoon off <laughs> where they were all being paid for a three hour session at Abbey Road. So you can imagine that that <laughs> they were quite happy with that. But I, I wouldn't have let them go if I didn't know that I had all the results and had it all in the bag, you know. But they they worked at, at such an extraordinary pace, and I was pushing things along as well. We got it all done. Mm, so it was a reward for their high performance. Yeah, yeah. So so if you like, they got a reward. They got a you know a session fee for doing nothing, mm. and it was a big session. So you know an international session. So it was not yeah. not just a normal um, you know hundred quid or whatever. It was a proper session fee. Got another lovely question for you. This one from Rob um, in the Q and A. I've seen a quote from you. My job is about 40% music, 60% diplomacy. Would you care to elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. Um, obviously, having, having had a, a fairly uh, a big and long musical training, I, I, I'm, you know, I do kind of know a little bit about music. Um, but um, the... The thing with the, the reason I said about the diplomacy is is knowing how you deal with the the kind of people like the Dame Shirley's that we saw earlier on, and how you deal with the big name artists that you frequently have to to get you they they you've got to get them to trust you really quickly. Um, Lady Gaga, for example. This is where the diplomacy thing really comes in. I was doing, it was a Royal Variety show. Lady Gaga was performing. Um, she sang her song Speechless and it was on a piano that was going to be hung 12 feet up in the air. And she was going to be hung up as well, which all happened. But in the rehearsal, the piano was on the deck of the stage. And, and Lady Gaga came onto the stage and she was introduced up, up there. I'm saying up there because from my point of view in the pit, I'm looking up at the stage. I'm looking up there at the stage. And um, and so she was up there and we we played through the song once and she got off the piano and she came down right down to me and the deck of the, the, the stage is there. And so she was right in front of me. She, she crouched down on her haunches and leant over to me and said, um, everything's fine, everything's fine, but um, would you, um, I, I, I need a couple of little changes and she started talking about those changes and then she said and can I can I take the score and look at the score and and I went yeah of course yeah absolutely of course take this you know so she took the score and went back to the piano and we did the song again and um and I suddenly realized I didn't have a score of course because she had the score 
fortunately, it's a fairly straightforward piece. So I was able to, um, you know, I knew how it started and finished and all, all the rest of it. So I was able to do that. But just that little interaction between us um, and, and the, you know, giving her the, the, the score, giving her the opportunity to make little changes if she needed to make those little changes, helped her to trust me. And when I, I've looked back at that little moment uh, fairly recently, and there's a point where she's playing quite, um, quite, quietly and quite softly and quite slowly and then there's a point where she wanted the orchestra to come in with a bang and she very clearly and brilliantly gives gives me that upbeat if you like with her head and downbeat with her head so I see I know that she trusts me to come in with the orchestra at that point in time so there's the I suppose that's the 60%, 40% music, 60% diplomacy. What about, um, somebody's also asked some questions about disruptors and uh, some difficult characters in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David uh, has asked that. So, you know, what thoughts have you got when it's been a real challenge to lead a team like that with disruptors and difficult characters? Yeah, I mean, I, I have been lucky. I, I have not had very many um, disruptive, or, or I've not noticed very many disruptive elements, but there are occasions when somebody will ask a question and you know that the, the, the reason they're asking the question is to see if they can trip you up. So it would be a question about a chord. It would be a question about what's happening at the end of a bar. It would be a very, usually a simple question, but a question that takes quite a lot of time to answer. <laughs> so, so I kind of know um, there's a certain way of looking at somebody and, 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 you know, you give your answer and you say, and we can talk further about it at the end if that still doesn't make sense. And you, then you move on. You know, and you make sure also that when you come to that point the second time, because um, frequently with these kind of things, there's a there, you know there's a repeat of this, the, the 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 same the same uh, bit of music. When you come to that point the second time, you make sure that you look at that person directly in the eye when you get there. And um, yeah, so I, I I I don't. I yeah. I've been so lucky. I've been so you know most orchestras are. are Ninety-nine point nine percent professional. Yeah, I suppose one of the things that you were talking about, I was just thinking about your the use of body language in communication. Because again, you, a lot of the time in what you're doing, real time in the performance, you can't actually speak to them because everybody's in, you know, visible. You can't shout, "Oi, do that!" You know, like other leaders oh. might do in a team. Say, "Right, let's talk about what we're going to do." You can't. You're in the moment. Um, but we could see from your video how physical and how much you're moving and communicating. And it sounds like using your eyes to monitor what's going on with them, too. Um, can you say a bit more about the sort of intention and how you use that? I, th I think um, I think that I think people, other musicians know whether you are a musical soul or not. And if if you're a if you do you know have music within you, and you start to try and communicate that music, they also want you to communicate that music. It doesn't mean that you analyze everything to the nth degree at at, at at any one point. What it means is that just at that point when they need to know something or feel something, that that you're there to help and to be on and to be on top of it. I suppose the other thing to think about is that a lot of a lot of my job in in the case of that putting together a concert, a lot of my job is in my preparation for the concert. And that would be that would be the stuff where I where I work out how I'm going to do this. How am I going to get around this little corner? What do I do about this slow down beginning end? Do, 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 how, you know, how do I make sure that I remember that the French horns come in there and make sure I remember that the trombones and trumpets come in there? Um, and sometimes I forget, but mostly I try and remember. Um, so that, that that preparation, and then and then you've got your three-hour rehearsal with them. 
So bear in mind, of course, also that it's a three hour rehearsal for a two hour concert. So you really have not got time to mess around. You really do. Have, as I said in the piece, you know, you, you have to move on and drive forward and you have to know when you have to know when you need to go over something one more time. Mm. And, 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 and when you decide that actually I'm going to leave that with them because I know that they'll do it OK. So th those are the difficult, I mean, those are, the, I suppose, the things that are much more difficult to teach and convey. And a lot of that would be, I suppose, experienced, to, you know, having now done, old, you know, 40 odd years of this sort of stuff. Yeah. And maybe listening to your gut as well of actually, I think that's going to, they'll be fine with that on their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, actually, I do want, you know, so something inside you will just, so you just follow. Yes, that. no, that's true. And I, I mean, there was one, one concert and I was, I had, um, I had a young protege um, who, who wanted to see what it was like to, to do one of these gigs. And, and he sat beside the regular piano player and, and there was this one little corner in this one piece that was a little bit just not quite not quite sitting together because the percussion and the and the brass and the strings were not quite on it and i i gently pointed that out and then moved on and 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 this person came up to me afterwards and said why did why didn't you rehearse that bit again mike why, why didn't you make sure that was okay? And I said, and this was before we did the concert, after the rehearsal. And I said, well, I'm going to trust them now. They know that that's got to be together. And I would have wasted like 10 minutes of the rehearsal going over it again and over it again. So this is the point where I just simply have to trust them. We got to that point in the concert and of course, it blissfully went through and it was completely together. And and this chap was still was sitting beside the piano player with 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 mouth slightly open. Go, oh yeah, I kind of get it now, you know. But 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 this uh, yes, it, he was he was a a young up and coming and hadn't had, you know, didn't kind of have that experience. Yeah. And that, what that it makes me think of is how much respect you must have for the professionalism of the people that you're working with in the orchestra totally. yeah totally. You know, that they, they share the same vision as you do which is we want this to be amazing we want to be delivering the most amazing performance ever for yeah. our audience and we'll 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 make it happen so you're yeah. respecting their professionals you're trusting them to to put that effort in outside of the rehearsal to make that work um, and then yes, that's true. And I think I think having that trust to know that when the red light goes on, when the recording light goes on, they will be giving you a hundred and ten percent. Having that, me trusting that from them, and them trusting me to also deliver, is mm -hmm. is kind of almost more important than anything else. You know. I mean, it is, it is quite a fascinating process. We've, um, we've had, a, it's not a question, but I think it's worth um, bringing it into the room. Uh, yes. a comment from David Hayes, who you might well know, Mike. I do know uh, David, yes. <laughs> he said, we've been lucky enough to work with or under Mike in his role as music supervisor. His leadership is effortless and instinctive insofar as he naturally positions himself as part of the team. And so he leads from the centre rather than the front that makes the entire collective deliver the task together and makes us want to work with him and for him so that's interesting i think that really relates to yeah yeah, yeah. that's a about. that's a, a what's well, a lovely statement from david and thank you very much and i'll give you the five pounds later <laughs> uh, no, no, no. but uh, no uh, but i uh, yes i mean i tell you what it is i tell you exactly what it is every so often i still pinch myself that I'm doing this. I still pinch myself that I'm with these extraordinary, extraordinary talented, vicariously, mentally weird, wonderful people. And, and, and that I have had such glorious times with those people. 
and I yes, yeah, so 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 it, it has to be trust. It has to be. I love that David saying saying you know leading from the center, but it's kind of yeah. It, it all goes back to you. You want them to do the very very best for themselves to be the very very best. And they want that too, by the sounds of things. So that's yeah. the, that's the converging of like minds, isn't it? Is this, mm-hmm. it leads me to link back to our thought, thoughts around what's important. One of the things that's really important in the high-performing team is purpose. Yes. The reason the team comes together. So the reason you're all there is to perform and entertain your audience beautifully, isn't it? Yes, that's absolutely. And I suppose the big difference is that that our performance is is the rehearsal for performance but in the actual performance itself you your direction as a leader is as you said earlier it's quiet it it, it has to be non-vocal most of the well pretty much all the time but it, no, it does have to be non-vocal yeah. uh, uh, and and so it is about body language and 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 i think everybody i mean i do love the fact that that when you're standing with a with a group of people who are who are playing and are at the top of their game there's this there's this glorious sense of um no i can't I can't put it into words i might get i might get get the right word in a minute but there's this glorious sense of unity mm. unity of purpose unity you know that that it i suppose for us it's easy to know that you've got the performance you've got to do the best you can in the performance otherwise it's gone mm-hmm. and that moment is gone in, in 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 a you know a leadership scenario maybe that's different but i think you can still learn from that i mean yeah there'll be teams who have moments when they have to be on mm-hmm. you know that's their performance isn't it yeah you know, whatever it might be yeah. And I think the other piece there, yeah, yeah, is how involved everybody else gets because, and I think that links to other teams too, which is when you're really high performing and you're absolutely on it, other people notice too. So obviously in a theatre or in a, a big stadium or, you know, a concert hall, you know, you get the audience and they know when everybody's absolutely nailed it too, because they're in it as well, aren't they? Because you then get the accolades and the standing absolutely. ovation. Absolutely. Yeah. And in business, I think, you know, your clients and your customers and your colleagues and other people notice that level of performance too people do we might not get the accolades though maybe it's you might not get the standing ovation or the (laughs) (laughs) one of one of the um one of the directors that i worked with years ago um she had a great phrase for if a show's going not so well she says that she said the show was punctuated by the sound of taxi doors closing Which basically means everybody's walked out. (laughs) You know, that's like, whoa, that's not what you want. That's not what you want. Oh, there's a lovely. Oh, you're going to do it, Jenny. Is this the question from Rob in Melbourne? What time of night it is for you, Rob? Well done for joining us. Um, When you first entered Trinity College of Music Dublin in the mid 1970s, did you have any idea you would become a leader in your field? Trinity College of Music, London, not London. Dublin, dear Rob. That, but don't worry about that. Um, no, of course not. Of course not. I mean, I, I, I knew, I knew that I wanted to. I knew I wanted to work in music, and I suppose from the end of my time at secondary school, I, I kind of knew that music was going to be the thing. But I didn't know what form. I didn't know what find necessarily of music and I've been very lucky that I've worked in pretty much every style of music you know from from classical through to you know I haven't done that much grime but um you know or dubstep but but you know but but doing stuff with you know but doing jazz rock and roll theater you know um they're they're all they're all different facets of the same thing they're all they're all forms of communication actually and what you're trying to do is you're trying to communicate with people and give them a story in the piece that you're conducting or the or 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 the song that you're working on you know everything comes back to story actually everything comes back to narrative 
Lovely. Um, one final thought. Uh, it was, it's, it, it's going back to David Hayes' uh, comment. He, I, I'm, I'm doing it in two parts for you, uh, okay. Mike. So he said he talked about um, you know the, the idea of you, you being leading from the centre rather than from the front, and how that was your first approach. Second approach, he said, is Mike is equally able to handle the difficult situations when they arise, as they inevitably do. Whereupon he delivers calm, strong, decisive, calm again, and reassuring, reassuring decisions when required. Yeah. How, do you, how important are all of those traits? Do you think for leaders in organisations as well? I, I, I think they're all utterly, utterly valuable um you know um you you do have to very occasionally say no we can't do that you have mm -hmm. to say you have to be not not be afeared of saying the word no mm -hmm. but but in saying no you have to be able to offer an alternative or 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 help that person find an alternative so mm -hmm. So, yes so obviously there have been some times and I know exactly what David is referring to a situation where we we were working together and we basically had to sack <laughs> two orchestrators and move on and get on to another scenario and that was quite tricky that was you know that was quite yeah that was quite tricky and it did that that I suppose that's another instance of the 60 percent diplomacy 40 percent musicianship <laughs> Um, yeah. that's like sacking somebody and making them feel that they're the that's the best thing that could have happened to them yeah. <laughs> you know yeah lovely yeah and so what about you know in when unexpected things happen Mike you, how do you handle that because you know that happens to us all the time in you know our leadership roles we've mm -hmm. planned we've practiced we think it's all sorted <laughs> and then something happens that yeah, the curved ball fails you I'm imagining you know things not working microphones not working and stuff oh like yeah that. yeah the, the, the curved ball scenario yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yes um well obvi obviously I mean if if something if something's live if something is a a a live transmission then um if something went drastically wrong if if the the term that I would use is if the chain came off you know if the yeah. chain came off then then I would go back and start again generally um and and I have done that I have done that once in in a in a, in a scenario where where it was live and I, uh, I hand up, I think we better start it, turn around the audience, I think we better start that again, don't you? You know, and then you get the audience on side and and, and that's all fine. Um, but ge yeah, generally, generally if the curved ball is, is if, is if a, an artist that you're working with isn't sure of when they're supposed to come in, when they're supposed to start singing, and if they miss that, then, or, or, or let me take, it, take that back another step. Your job is to try to make sure that they don't miss that. Yeah. Right. So that they are confident that, you know, this has happened to me a number of times where, where uh, an artist has, has, we've done the rehearsal and, and they've slightly missed it in the rehearsal. And then we've had a little bit of a conflab, a little bit of a chat. And they've said, oh, Mike, can you can you just look, you know, give me a give me the nod, whatever, so that I know where it is. And and I'm, I'm touching wood now, <laughs> but, you know, most of the time I've managed to 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 do that and, and be there for them and give them that just that little look. You know, we we're talking earlier about the look and the and, and the, you know. You have to keep your eyes open most of the time. Sometimes you have to look down and go, where are we? Okay, we're there. And then you're up, you know. There's that communication, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So but communication is paramount, absolutely. Yeah. Mike, we're getting towards the end of our, our time together, and it's been absolutely fabulous. Some lovely, I think some lovely analogies there for leaders who are not in your world, who are in other industries, leading teams in, who are doing very different things, but still wanting to achieve that high performance and wanting yeah. to, you know, perform on the night, to use that analogy, and to, you know, give, give their audience, their stakeholders, um, an amazing experience. And I think um, I've, I've certainly taken a lot from this. So um, hopefully our participants on this webinar have also been uh, getting a lot out of it too. Ali, do you yeah. want to say 
Yeah, I'd agree with Nick Bailey, who said that, you know, the process and experience uh, with you is an overwhelmingly human one. Um, so it's not just professional. It, and that it's a very remarkable trait that you have. And um, it makes anything possible. Um, so I think, you know, for us other leaders trying to learn from this, that's a really inspiring place. Um, and thank you for the lessons and insights, Mike. A yes. Great pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And um, and if you want to read a bit more, there's always the book. <laughs> there there is. is. Shameless plug for the book. Yeah, there we go. Shameless plug for the book. On it's on Amazon um, and it's a really good read and lots of amazing stories of a wonderful career and great experience. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. And hope to see our next uh, uh, interview with another leader in their field. Thank you, Thank very, you. Much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.